every day. As gloom descends increasingly on the capitals, capitals of the West, we're starting to see clearer, ever clearer signs that we are now moving in a steady trajectory towards the final Russian victory in this war. A victory, the, the extent and scope of which we outside the Kremlin do not know, but which it is now increasingly clear to me, the extent of which will be decided exclusively by the Russians. Anyway, let us discuss what is actually going on in Ukraine as I'm making this programme. Now, there's been a cascade of reports, and last night there was yet another heavy missile strike by the Russians against Ukraine. And um, we have a brief, not entirely helpful, um, account of what happened from the Russian Defence Ministry, but as is often the way, it does give us some clues. It says, last night, the armed forces of the Russian Federation launched a high-precision strike using a long-range air, sea and ground-based, presumably missiles, to include Kinzhal hypersonic air-launched ballistic missiles, along with an unmanned aerial vehicles against power and air defence facilities of the armed forces of Ukraine. The goal of the strike has been achieved. All the targets have been engaged. So this is another major strike. The Russian Defence Ministry confirmed the use of Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. Tantalisingly, they're also talking about sea-launched missiles. Now we have a complex issue to wrestle with because sea-launched missiles could include uh, Zircon hypersonic missiles, possibly, or Calibre subsonic missiles of the kind that the Russian military has regularly launched against Ukraine. I'm going to stick with the conservative view that Calibre, it was Calibre missiles that were launched over the course of the strike which took place yesterday. And the Russian Defence Ministry tells us that the targets were power and air defence facilities of the armed forces of Ukraine. Now, I'm going to make a guess that the Kinjals were used to knock out, destroy in other words, air defence systems, though the Russians have not told us which air defence systems were destroyed. There's one reference in this same military bulletin, that one S-300 SAM systems radar was destroyed, but one gets the sense perhaps more of that has been going on than we know about. But anyway, the, the Russians used Kinjal hypersonic weapons to knock out, to destroy what is left of Ukraine's air defense system. And as the air defense system becomes depleted, the Russians are able to destroy the other targets that they're focusing upon with their subsonic missiles. And it's quite clear that the primary purpose now is power engineering facilities, power uh, production, rather, facilities, power stations, that kind of thing. And apparently, um, overnight, electric power was finally restored to Kharkov, but it's clear that the major power stations around Kharkov have been destroyed. Other power stations have also been destroyed in eastern Ukraine. The power that is being sent to eastern Ukraine is being sent there from western Ukraine, putting more stress on the whole energy system. And this is where we come back to what happened during the Russian missile offensive against Ukraine's energy system in 2022-2023. Now, I've discussed that missile offensive in many programmes. It's clear 
to me, at least, that one of its primary purposes, was in which it was successful, was to deplete Ukraine's air defense system, to force Ukraine to use lots of its air defense missiles to parry these Russian attacks, causing the missile system, the air defense missile system, to become critically depleted. And we see the effect of that, uh, and it is getting worse with each passing week. The Russians also, most probably, used the attacks on the energy system to interfere with, Rush with Ukrainian troop movements. This is pointed out to me by a source, a well-informed source, and he pointed out that since Ukraine uses trains to move troops around from one location to another, and since trains in Ukraine work on electric traction, knocking out the power system, even if only for relatively short periods of time, would interfere with Ukraine's ability to move troops. And this helped the Russians because it bought time for them. It impeded Ukraine's launch of offensives, giving more time to the Russians for the Russians to complete the construction of the Surovikin line. But the third objective that the Russians had over the course of 2022, 2023, was to understand how the air defence system worked. This was pointed out, as I've repeatedly said, in an article that John Helmer published back in the autumn of 2022 in Dances with Bears, his website. In it, he said that the Russians were striking at the energy system in order to understand it better and in order to establish its weak points. And the point is that they were striking specifically at the distribution system. Now, they could have struck the big power generating uh, um, establishments, industrial establishments, the power stations and all of those things. But they didn't do that. They struck instead at the distribution facilities. And they did it repeatedly, month after month, gradually getting a clear sense of how these distribution facilities worked and how it was that Ukraine transferred electric power from one part of the country to another. And Helmer said that they were doing this in preparation for the big offensive, which would eventually come. And now we can see how this is working out. So in eastern Ukraine, the Russians are methodically destroying the power stations, which means that Ukraine cannot use power stations in eastern Ukraine to provide electric power to east Ukrainian cities, villages, railway lines, industrial facilities, troops on the ground relying on the use of the power system. The Ukrainians, for the moment, can to some extent mitigate this by transferring electric power from the West. But with the Russians now having a complete picture of the energy distribution system in Ukraine, and with there being no realistic possibility that Ukraine can rebuild the power stations before the Russian offensive begins. The Russians can launch strikes against the distribution system in the next, in, 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 in conjunction with their offensive and blacken out the whole of eastern Ukraine even as that offensive begins. So, this is what the Russians are leading up to. It tells us, this tells us, tells me definitely, that way back in the autumn of 2022, 
the Russians had already begun planning for a big offensive in eastern Ukraine. That was what their missile strikes at that time were preparing for. And the fact that they've now taken the further step of knocking out the power systems so that only it is only through vulnerable distribution centers that East Ukraine continues to get electric power. That tells me that the Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine is starting to come within sight. So this is potentially very important news. We'll see how it works out. But all of this looks to me to be completely consistent with a carefully prepared and methodically executed plan, probably worked out by the Russians over the course of the autumn of 2022. Now, if we go to the mechanics of these missile strikes, it's clear that they have developed to a very high degree of sophistication. We have Geram-2 drones now operating on a nightly basis in ever larger numbers. Um, they have the effect of carrying out strikes on less well-defended facilities. They also used to draw what air defense systems still exist, opening up the way for attacks by subsonic missiles. We see that the hypersonic missiles, the Kinjals, and perhaps from time to time now the Zircons, are used to strike at the um, um, air defense facilities. And they're doing that with growing effectiveness. In doing that, they also work in conjunction with Iskander, ground-based ballistic missiles, which the Russians have also been using much more aggressively in the last few weeks. But there's also been significant updates to the subsonic missiles as well. Firstly, their warhead has increased. We've been told that the warheads of these cruise missiles, the KH-101, has increased from 450 kilos to 800 kilos. A very, very big, powerful warhead. And the reason this has been done and is possible is because the KH-101 is designed to have a range of 5,500 kilometers. It's a huge range. The Russians do not need that the full extent of that range in order to be able to strike at targets in Ukraine. Missiles with ranges below 3,000 kilometers, 2,500 kilometers, apparently, are fully sufficient for the Russians to be able to not only hit every target in Ukraine, but to be able to carry out maneuvers to dodge air defense missiles and that kind of thing. Anyway, the Russians, therefore, have decided to accept a certain reduction in the range of their KH-101 missiles and have compensated by reducing the fuel load and increasing the size of the warhead. But it is not only the fact that these missiles have become much more powerful so that when they impact on a target, there is a much bigger and more devastating explosion. They've also become much more accurate. And we know this because an official of Ukraine's energy network gave a despairing interview on Ukrainian television in which he said that Russian cruise missiles have become, become an order of magnitude more accurate than they used to be. Whereas in the winter of 2022-2023, they could hit, they would, they, the targets they hit would be within 
two or three hundred meters of the aiming point. Now the precision of a strike is almost down to the level of just one meter. Now Simplicius the Thinker has just published a long piece discussing various aspects of the war, but he actually explains this. He says that with the collapse of Ukraine's air defense system, <clears throat> the Russians have started to take off decoys from their air launch cruise missiles <clears throat> and are replacing them with more um, receivers of data from their GLONASS satellite network. And this has had an exponential this has led to an exponential improvement in accuracy and jamming resistance. Now, to get a sense of the extent to which these missile strikes are now taking place against a background of a collapsed air defense system, we need to go back to what that official from the energy system said. He said that two of the power stations that had been destroyed were attacked by eight KH-101 missiles. Eight missiles were attacked, attacked each one of these power stations. So you can imagine the extent of the devastation, the knockout, the massive damage that attacks by these missiles would cause on these power stations. And by the way, it gives us a insight as to the extent of the power, the force that the Russians are able to apply. And I have to say it, it says something about the number of missiles they now have at their disposal, that they can devote eight missiles to admittedly big and important targets. That tells us how powerful, as I said, the Russian uh, forces have become. Clearly, there is no shortage of missiles, at least at the moment. Now, I'm going to move on from this just to make one further point. The Russians <clears throat> seem to be intent on isolating or, or preparing to isolate eastern Ukraine from the rest of Ukraine's power network. I can't help but wonder, just saying this, whether on the occasion of their offensive, they will take further steps to isolate eastern Ukraine from the rest of Ukraine, and where, whether at that point we might finally start to see missile strikes against the Dnieper bridges. Now, the Russians have recently been attacking hydroelectric facilities along dams across the Dnieper, um, these attacks, again, demonstrate the extreme levels of accuracy that the Russians are achieving in their missile strikes. It seems that the, dam the dams themselves have been left undamaged, which is impressive. But we now have subsonic Q cruise missiles with warheads of 800 kilos, we see that the Russians can use eight missiles to attack one target. We're also getting, we're also seeing Kinjar hypersonic missiles used to an ever greater extent. And of course, lurking in the background of the gigantic KH-2232 supersonic anti-ship missiles that have proved incredibly powerful when used in a ground attack role. And last but not least, the Russians are now wheeling out huge precision-guided winged bombs. We're told that the Fab 3000s with warheads of perhaps one and a half thousand kilos are also now entering, well, they are now in production and may be entering service very soon. So 
if the Russians do want to knock out the bridges of the Dnieper, I've discussed in previous programs that bridges are very difficult targets to destroy. They're massive constructions. One should not take what happened to the bridge in Baltimore as representative of what might happen to a bridge, uh, one of these bridges in, along the Dnieper, if it was simply attacked by ordinary bombs or missiles, it would probably take an enormous number of conventional bombs to destroy a bridge of the kind of massive bridges that have been built across the Dnieper. But if the Russians do now decide to launch an attack on the Dnieper bridges, they've demonstrated that they have the accuracy and they have weapons with the explosive power to bring down those bridges. So that may be what will come. Now, again, I'm just saying this. I'm not saying that this is the Russian plan. Um, I'm just making the observation that the Russians now unequivocally do have that capability. If they make a plan to knock out the deeper bridges, they're in a position to do it. Now, there's been much discussion about what this would all mean, whether in the event that the Russians knocked out the bridges and the energy system, that would cause them enormous problems trying to replace these bridges and that energy system, that there would be enormous costs in doing so, especially if the Russians did want to move to Western Ukraine. I'm going to push back a little on some of these claims. If, first of all, I don't know what the Russians plan. Maybe they have no plans anyway to move beyond the Dnieper. Just saying. But assuming they do, assuming the war ends with the Russians in full occupation of the whole of Ukraine, well, undoubtedly, they would have to re rebuild the bridges across the Dnieper to re-establish communications. Undoubtedly, they would have to rebuild the energy system. And that would be an expensive undertaking. But it is not quite as expensive or difficult to do as I think some people suppose. Now, again, going back to an earlier period in my life, I remember reviewing the economic reconstruction in the Soviet Union and Germany after the Second World War. Devastation was done on a orders of magnitude greater scale then than in anything we are seeing now in the current war. And yet both the Germans and the Soviets were able to rebuild the infrastructure, and in the case of the Soviets, the deeper bridges, and in fact build even more bridges across the Dnieper, and restore the economies of Germany, and we're speaking now specifically about Ukraine, to a functional level within a remarkably short time. The lesson that I learned, and it was discussed extensively, there's a significant literature from the 50s about this. The lesson that I learned was that actually refurbishing plant and infrastructure that has been damaged by bombing is actually not as difficult or as expensive as one might suppose. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that topic. Again, to stress, the general staff, the Russian general staff, do not share my th their thoughts and opinions with me. I don't know what it is exactly that they're planning in any particular point in the war. Maybe they have no plans to destroy the Dnieper bridges. Maybe they have no plans to cut off the electricity supply to eastern Ukraine. They have not so far said that they have any plan to launch a big offensive in eastern Ukraine.
at any point, let alone at some point in the next few months. So let's, you know, bear all of that in mind. All I am saying is that the capability to cut off the electric supply to eastern Ukraine now exists. The capability to take out the, the Dnieper bridges now exists. The Russians have demonstrated it. The fact that they've now achieved it perhaps should set a warning bell that we are coming close to the point when an offensive in the East might happen, an offensive intended to bring eastern Ukraine, east of the Dnieper River, under Russian control, that we're coming close to that point. And, well, the task of reconstruction, very great as it would no doubt be, might not be quite as great as some people think. Anyway, that's the news in the missile and air war. Lots going on on the battlefronts. And the first thing to say is that perhaps the most important news, though it's not yet been confirmed, I've been saying over the last few programs that the Russian advance west of Avdevka from um, the village of Tornenka, um, capturing the fields north of Pervomaisky, puts the Ukrainian position in Pervomaisky in an undefendable state, that the defense of Pervomaisky has now become impossible. And sure enough, Early this morning, reports came pouring in that the Russians have now occupied the entire central area of Pervomaisky. The Ukrainians allegedly control around 15% of the town, so that most of the town is now under Russian control. And then, shortly before I made this video, Dima at the Military Summary Channel said that he's now seeing reports that the Ukrainians have pulled out of Pervomaisky entirely, that they recognize that their positions there are now undef undefendable and that they have been left with no option other than to pull them out because if they keep them there, they would risk placing those men in Pervomaisky in a cauldron. Now, I want to stress this is only in this is information I've obtained from watching Dima's channel, uh, the military summary channel. I've not seen that confirmed elsewhere. Maybe lots of confirmation to this effect exists about the earlier big Russian advances in Pervomaisky, the fact that the Russians are in control of the center of this small town, 28,000 people before. Uh, the start of the war. Uh, well, about that, I am sure, whether it is indeed true that the Ukrainians have entirely pulled out of Pervomaisky, about that, I can't be so sure. Anyway, it seems to me that it's highly likely that before long we'll be getting pictures of Russian soldiers raising the Russian flag over various buildings in Pervomaisky. And if we follow the pattern, it's also likely, if the Ukrainians have pulled out, that the Russians will gradually occupy the western part of Pervomaisky, which the Ukrainians supposedly have now vacated. We might even start to see more pictures of more Russian soldiers raising the Russian flag over that part of Pervomaisky as well. And then the Russians will begin a major process of clearing the town of any Ukrainian stragglers, of demining it and eliminating any booby traps that the Ukrainians have left behind. And then at some point over the next couple of days, the Russian Defense Ministry will finally confirm
that Perwomyski has fallen. This process can last quite a long time, even if it is true that the Ukrainians have pulled out of Perwomyski. And it could be a week or more before the Russian Defense Ministry finally confirms that Perwomyski has indeed fallen to Russia. Now, I'm going to say straight away that I think that this battle of Pervomaisky has attracted far too little attention. There's been overwhelming focus on the Battle of Avdevka, a town of 32,000 before the war. Um, there's also lots of talk about the battle for Chasovyar, west of Bakhmut, town of 12,000. For some reason, I don't fully understand. People have shown much less interest in what happens in Pervomaisky, Though, as I said, at 28,000, it is not an insignificant place. And, of course, the capture of Pervomaisky, so it seems to me, glancing at map, is important because it links together what is going on in the Avdevka area with what is going on in the Marinka area, in this area of central Donbass, once the Russians have consolidated control of Pervomaisky, it makes it easier for them to advance towards Korakovo from the northeast. It also makes it easier for the Russians, if they choose, to move south towards Krasnogorovka, which continues to be contested. And of course, it also makes it easier for the Russians to move west towards Pakrovsk. So I think that Pervomaisky is both strategically important as well as being symbolically important as a big place with what was once apparently a large factory complex. I believe making optical equipment, but I might be wrong about that, a big factory complex left over from the Soviet Union was once located there. So anyway, that potentially big news. There's also more news from other places. There's been reports that the Russians have now um, further increased advances around Novo Mikhailovka. Seems to me, again, that if we're talking about this big village about 1,400 people before the war, that perhaps the Ukrainians are clinging on to about 20% of it, and that they're surrounded now clearly by three sides, on three sides, and that the roads leading into Novomikhailovka are very much under Russian fire control. So I'm not sure why the Ukrainians are still clinging on, have decided to still cling on to Novomikhailovka, but most likely, that village is also about to fall. And this morning, there was also some reports from um, uh, on Slavyangrad that the Russians have also made further progress in the Chasovya area. They have closed in further closer to Chasovya and that the situation of the Ukrainians in Chasovya is becoming more difficult. I'm not sure to what extent, by the way, that is true. But anyway, that was a that was some of the news that I saw coming from there. But there's also apparently been some very important news from the Avdevka area. Now, as I discussed, as I've discussed in many programs. The Orlovka Toninka line has collapsed. Orlovka, Orlovka Toninka Berdichi line has collapsed. Orlovka and Toninka have fallen. The fall of Toninka has opened the way for the Russian advance westward and has led to the fall of Pervomaisky, as I said that it would. Um, there is now an incredibly long and rather confusing uh, discussion by Redovka about the situation 
in the villages of Berdici and um, Semyonka, Semyonovka, Semyonovka. Now, I'm not going to read this um, account from Radovka. Radovka, to remind everyone, is a Russian newspaper, more more a website than a newspaper, but a you know very heavy detailed website, published in Smolensk. It's very much on the patriotic end of the Russian political spectrum. It has reporters who seem to be very well informed um, about the overall situation in the war. And, well, it tells us that the armed forces of Ukraine risk losing the core of two mechanized and one assault brigade in the Avdevsky area. And it says that Counter battles between units of the Russian armed forces and units of the 47th Mechanized Brigade, with the support of four other uh, territorial defense forces in Berdichi, have taken on a dramatic character for the armed forces of Ukraine. And then it says that uh, from the south, bypassing water barriers, Russian uh, troops um, have been able to overcome resistance from units of the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade, that is, of course, the Azov Brigade, and the 110th Mechanized Brigade, and that they managed to gain a foothold in the village of Semenyovka, which is south of Berdichi. And it says that Sirsky has miscalculated. It says that um, the... Um, military leadership of Ukraine, which is, of course, Sirsky, um, relied on wearing down the offensive potential of the Russian forces by constantly counterattacking in Berdichi. And this was supposedly going to stabilize the front line. The 47th Mechanized Brigade was used to do this. There was over-reliance on a chain of reservoirs in, in front of Semyonovka um, in, the, in, in anticipation that this would complicate Russian attacks. Um, but things have not turned out as the Ukrainians anticipated. Um, the Russians instead have been able to break through into Semyonovka Semyon Semyonovka, and this has left the Ukrainians with a, in a very difficult situation. They have to fight for control of Semyonovka and what is left of Berdichi, because if they now retreat in the face of the advancing Russian army, the retreat risks disintegrating into chaos. And moreover, the Ukrainians, if they were to cling on to Berdichi and Semyonovka, if they were to retreat from these two villages, they would have to use roads which are really earth, dirt roads, over which the Russians now have fire control. It says the route of possible escape runs along a dirt road through fields with a length of five to seven kilometers from Berdichi Semenyovka to Novozelovka. The route would become a shooting range for Russian artillerymen and anti-tank gun missile operators. Under these circumstances, the chances of an orderly withdrawal of enemy personnel and the preservation of their equipment would become increasingly vague. That's what Radovka says. And of course, Radovka makes the point that the 47th Mechanized Brigade is equipped with valuable Western supplied equipment 
weapons. They're the people who've been using the Abrams tanks. They've already lost five. And the Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. I've lost count, long since lost count, of how many of those they've lost. Anyway, if they try to retreat along these roads, it could turn into something of a disaster. But alternatively, if they try to hold out in these two places, Semyonovka and Berdichi, then they risk suffering an even bigger debacle with the ultimate destruction of two of their best assault brigades, the 47th Mechanized Brigade and the 110th Mechanized Brigade. And also they would risk losing um, the other territorial forces that they are um, that they ha that they have in this area, and um, it then goes on to say that um, the enemy command may find reserves this time, but the main feature of the reserves of the Supreme High Command of Ukraine is that they are quickly running out, and the Radovka says that despite. Ukraine's overall shortage of artillery, the Ukrainian forces are not saving artillery and trying to use all available means to ensure a successful counterattack in Semyonovka. The stakes are high. The failure of the defence and the inevitable abandonment of Berdichi threatens dire consequences. Well, that's Redovka's analysis. I don't argue with it, by the way. It seems to me to make perfect sense. It is entirely consistent with what uh, Sirsky, whom I'm going to come to later in the programme, and Zelensky have constantly, repeatedly done. They've overcommitted to defending and holding a particular defence line, an undefendable defence line. They did that in Bakhmut. They did that before in Severodonetsk, Lysychansk. They did this again in Avdevka, and it looks like they're doing it again in the berdichi semyonovka area. Though perhaps this time, if this report by Redovka is correct, the consequences might be particularly dire. Anyway, we shall see. There are other reports of further Russian advances in other places. It seems that the Russians have now pushed through most of the village of Georgievka to the west of Marinka um, with um, Novomikhailovka about to fall and Georgievka about to fall. The route is opening for an attack on Kurachovo from the east, just as the fall of Pervomaisky which is surely pending, combined with the fall of Nevolskoy, which took place about two weeks ago, is opening the way for an attack on Kurachovo from the northwest. So, um, advances by the Russians in that direction also. If we put it all together, this is an increasingly grim picture. Um, towns are starting to fall in eastern Ukraine. Fortified towns are starting to fall. The sequence began with Marinka in December. It then continued with Avdevka. It looks like Pervomaisky is likely to fall, perhaps within hours, perhaps within days. We'll see. Um, Krasnogorovka is certain to fall if Pervomaisky falls, or so it seems to me. Kurachovo will probably fall soon after. Once Kurachovo falls, Vugledar, further south, perhaps the most heavily fortified place of all, starts to look undefendable and will probably, before long, fall as well. We can see how this game, this complex game, of checkers is playing out and the vigor with which the Russians are now conducting it. And of course, there, remain, there remains much fighting to do. 
in the Bakhmut area. But plausibly, we're going to see an attack on Chasufya start to shape up fairly soon there also. And it seems that there are growing threats to Siversk, with the Russian forces gradually consolidating their positions to the south of Siversk and gaining control of more villages there, and the Russians continuing to shell and bomb uh, um, Ukrainian positions along the Zherebets River. So it's likely that over the next few weeks, we're going to start to see one small Donbass town duck tumbling one after the other into the Russians' hands, with the Ukrainians finding it more and more difficult to withstand Russian advances. <clears throat> and in the meantime, we see how the Russians have are now carefully positioning themselves where they could black out the whole of eastern Ukraine, if that is what they plan, and perhaps following my own thought, and it is only a thought, the Russians in a position, if they choose, to deliver what would surely be the coup de grace, cutting off Ukrainian forces in the east by knocking out the Dnieper bridges. Well, that is the looming picture. What are the Ukrainians doing and saying in response to it? Well, we have had two of the most, well, I found them upsetting. Others will no doubt have other views. Two of the most extraordinary, delusional, bizarre and surreal interviews I've ever seen in my life come from the two people who are in Ukraine making the overall decisions. One is from Sirsky and the other is from Zelensky. Now let's start with Sirsky because he's the overall commander. He says, first of all, that there were grave issues with Zeluzhny, which is why he had to be replaced. So Sirsky, he's now slightly dropping the mask. The mask. He's telling us that Zeluzhny wasn't quite as good as he was made up, made out to be. With that, by the way, I agree. It's about the only thing that Sirsky says in this interview that he has given, which I do agree with. He then says that the job of a commander, of a, of a military officer, is not to question orders but to carry them out. They must carry out unquestioningly the orders of the commander-in-chief. The commander-in-chief being, of course, Zelensky. You do not argue, debate, or discuss things with the commander-in-chief. You just do whatever it is that he, tell you, he tells you to do. That is the role, apparently, of a military commander. I think that is absolutely ridiculous. I think that is one of the most nonsensical and absurd things I have ever heard at any point in any war. It's been suggested that in talking in that way, Sirsky is simply mirroring the philosophy of Field Marshal Keitel, um, the German military officer who carried out the functions of defense minister, German defense minister during the Second World War. He, he, that wasn't his official position. He was the senior military officer within the, Ob the o OKW, the German High Command. But basically, he did the job of defense minister. Anyway, reputedly, according to many stories, um, Keitel simply agreed with everything that um, he's, the, the German leader, the mustachio gentleman, told him to do. And it is a fact that apparently amongst German officers, he got the nickname La Keitel, Lackey, because of the way in which he behaved. Well, I can say straight away, because I've studied this history carefully, people are harder on Keitel than um, the facts deserve. Even he would sometimes argue back. 
And if we go to the other side, Marshal Zhukov, who was the deputy commander-in-chief of the Soviet armed forces through much of the Second World War, he never hesitated to argue back with Stalin. And Stalin, incidentally, apparently appreciated him doing so. So, there we are. Sirsky, however, takes a different view. He thinks that the job of a general is simply to do whatever his commander-in-chief tells him, however absurd or ridiculous or nonsensical it is. Uh, we will see that on this issue, at least, Zelensky appears to agree with him. And then Sirsky gives us an astonishing perspective of the situation on the battle lines. He says that, well, you know, we did have to withdraw from Avdevka. We needed to do that in order to save lives. But since then, we've stabilized the situation. Yes, it is difficult in some places. Yes, the Russians do have rather powerful bombs. But then, of course, in war, it's, things are always difficult. And at the moment, we're holding our own. And we're even counterattacking in places and over some unspecified period of time. We, the Ukrainians, have actually recaptured more territory from the Russians than the Russians have gained from us. I, I, I have absolutely no idea what Sirsky is talking about. I, I follow the fighting every day. I find it a grim and depressing experience. I have not heard of any Ukrainian advance anywhere at any point over the last few months, not since October. The Institute for the Study of War has said that since October, the Russians have captured 250 square kilometers of territory. They're playing down the significance of that. They're saying that this is a relatively small amount of territory relative to the losses that the Russians have suffered. And it is, none of it is of any great strategic or tactical significance. I disagree completely, by the way. But anyway, even the Institute of the Study of War, run by Victoria Newland's family, the Kagans, it accepts and acknowledges that it is the Russians who are advancing. And we see the evidence of that everywhere. Yes, every so often, the Ukrainians do not push the Russians back. There is a attacks in various places. There's a complex fight going on in Rabotino, for example. In, there's a similar complex battle going on in places like Sinkovka, near Kupiansk, and Belogorodka, near, um, um, near uh, Siversk. I think, as I say straightforwardly, I think the Russians could have captured all of these places long ago had they decided to commit the necessary resources to doing so. Um, the reason the Russians haven't captured these three villages is because it is not a priority for them at the present time. Their priorities are elsewhere, in central Donbass, and we see that here they're making decisive advantage, advances. But anyway, yes, you can talk about these defensive successes, if that's what you want to call them, but really... To claim that recently the Ukrainians are advancing and the Russians are retreating, that is absurd. And then Sirsky then also tells us that all that Ukraine needs is to be given lots and lots of more weapons. And if they get weapons in the West, then they can achieve victory, which is delusional. He does acknowledge one thing, that the plan... And, by the way, it clearly was a plan. The plan to call up half a million men has, to all intents and purposes, been abandoned. There is no prospect or possibility of getting half a million men. The Ukrainian military is going to have to accept far fewer. Even the silly idea silly in these circumstances, of demobilizing Ukrainian soldiers. It appears has been abandoned as well. 
the manpower shortage in the Ukrainian army is so severe that Ukraine can't afford to do it. So that was Sirsky. As I said, very bizarre, very unreal. But then we had an even more astonishing interview with, by Zelensky, given to David Ignatius of the Washington Post, a um, person, David Ignatius, who many people believe um, is very well connected to the US intelligence community. I've heard it suggested that he is the voice of the CIA. I don't know whether that's true or not, by the way. But anyway, oh, certainly a very high powered reporter indeed. And well, it's not quite as surreal as um, Sirsky's interview, but it's not far from being that also. First of all, David Ignatius gives us the background. He says that Zelensky spoke in a sandbagged, heavily guarded presidential compound that seemed nearly empty of its old civilian workforce after more than two years of war. The security was so tight I had to surrender my plastic felt-tip pens. But Ignatius tells us Zelensky appeared as animated and pugnacious as when he made his defiant stand in the courtyard when the war began. And the article continues. Zelensky, the actor who became a wartime president, now totally inhabits this role. He wore his habitual dress of a Ukrainian military sweatshirt and combat pants. He looked less haggard here on his home ground than he had been about a month ago at a security conference in Munich. He seems to relish being the symbol of a nation at war. Now, I may be doing a massive injustice to David Ignatius, who does, despite what I've just said about him, come across to me as a very clever man. But I have to say, all of this seems to me full of double entendres. We have Zelensky all by himself playing a role, a role which Ignatius tells us that he now inhabits, a role of the heroic wartime president. And he's doing this in a largely empty building, surrounded by sandbags and armed guards. It's not, to me, a reassuring picture. It's not a picture of a man who's winning the war. And yes, he might be more animated and more um, less haggard than he was a month ago in Munich. After all, a month ago in Munich, that was the time when Avdevka fell, so one can understand why he might um, feel haggard and run down. But anyway, it still all suggests to me a certain detachment from reality. And there are some glimmers of admissions. He says, for example, if there, this is Zelensky, if there, are, if there is no U.S. support, it means that we have no air defense, no Patriot missiles, no jammers for electronic warfare, no 155 millimeter artillery rounds. It means we will go back, retreat step by step in small steps. Small steps. How does Zelensky believe that these steps can be kept small if there are, if there is no air defense, no air Patriot missiles, no jammers for electronic warfare, no 155 millimeter artillery rounds. And Zelensky then apparently gave Ignatius an example of what he means. He says, if you need 8,000 rounds of ammunition a day to defend the front line, 
but you only have 2,000 rounds, you have to do less. Statement of the obvious, one might have thought. Anyway, he then goes on to say, of course, to go back, make the front line shorter. If it breaks, the Russians could go to the big cities. And then a sentence which I have to say completely took my breath away. We are trying to find some way not to retreat. We have stabilised the front situation because of smart steps by our military. If the front remains stable, Ukraine can arm and train new brigades in the rear to conduct a new counteroffensive later this year. If you're not taking further steps towards to prepare another counteroffensive, Russia will take them. That's what we learned in this war. If we don't do it, Russia will. Zelensky has learned absolutely nothing from this war, so it seems to me. He's talking about holding a front line. He thinks that if he has no air defence, inadequate numbers of shells, a number of um, insufficient electronic jamming, well, he can still somehow cling on and maintain a front line, apparently on sheer willpower. And he is still talking about a counteroffensive, despite last year's counteroffensive ending in a disastrous debacle. I have to say, it just leaves me speechless. And of course, he admits that the situation with air defense is impossible. He says that um, he was asked, Ignatius asked him whether it was true that Ukraine is short of air defense interceptors and air defense weapons. He said, that's true. I don't want Russia to know what number of air defense missiles we have. But basically, you're right. Without the support of Congress, we will have a big deficit of missiles. This is the problem. We are increasing our own air defense systems. But it is not enough. Again, what is he talking about? What air defense systems is Ukraine producing? Perhaps anti-aircraft cannon? But S-300s? Patriots? Book-type missiles? Again, it is delusional. And um, he then talks about how if the um, Russians continue to attack Ukraine's energy infrastructure, Ukraine will have to do the same. And um, he says that at that point, even though the Americans, he readily concedes, are not happy about doing this. But he goes on to say that he's going to attack the, Rus the Russian infrastructure, the Russian energy complex with his drone fleets, because that's the only way to stop the Russians destroying Ukraine's energy system. If there is no air defense to protect our energy system and the Russians attack it, my question is, why can't we answer them? Their society has to learn to live without petrol, without diesel, without electricity. It's fair. When Russia will stop these steps, we will stop. And he seems to have some strange idea that the attackers will enable him to do that, even though they have only a 300 kilometer range. And he says that he wants to use the attackers missiles basically to drive the Russian air force out of Crimea, amongst other things. But let's just hold on to this suggestion that these pinprick attacks by Ukraine on Russian oil refineries are somehow of equal effect to the attacks by the Russians on Ukrainian energy facilities. In order to conduct a missile and air campaign against Russia, which would have effects that are even fractionally comparable to those to that of the missile and air campaign that Russia is conducting against Ukraine, you would need a commitment of forces. 
you would need drone fleets and missile fleets on a scale undreamed, probably beyond the power of the United States. It would be comparable to something, it would probably be a greater effort to achieve that than what was attempted, say, what was done by the Allies over Germany and Japan during the Second World War. Russia is the world's biggest country. Its energy facilities are dispersed across a colossal territory. It has the best and most sophisticated air defense system in the world. The idea that Ukraine with attack and missiles and drones can do any significant damage on a Russian energy complex spread across a territory so vast and so strongly defended is completely ridiculous. It is, in fact, absurd. It, it again demonstrates how completely delusional Zelensky is. And even in terms of attacks on Crimea, he says when the Russians attack them, 300s are the answer. When Russia knows we can destroy their jets in Crimea, they will not attack from Crimea. It's like with the sea fleet, we push them from our territorial waters. Now we will push them from the airports in Crimea. Again, this is completely delusional. As I've said previously, the, this whole story of the victory over the Russian fleet in the Black Sea has been peddled endlessly. It appears to have been taken seriously very dangerously by no less a person than Zelensky himself. The Ukrainians have launched attack after attack after attack with storm shadow missiles on Crimea. All that happens is that the Russians shoot most of them down. And there's no reason to think that the attackers will be any different. The whole thing is just, I mean, it is, it is weird. And again, it shows how completely detached from reality Zelensky has become. It's unsurprising that Sirsky is telling us that a commander, the job of a commander, is simply to carry out orders rather than to question. Because clearly, when you have somebody leading you who has retreated into this make-believe world, then that is the only kind of commander he will tolerate. And for confirmation of this, we've had reports of a whole series of further officials who Zelensky has sacked. Sergei Shefir, uh, who was one of Zelensky's advisors, has just been sacked. A number of other advisors, I've just taken the names now from uh, um, Slavyangrad. I don't know anything about any of these people. Radutsky, Trofimov, Pusharyov, uh, Ustenko, Verbitska, they've all been sacked one after another, um, apparently. They've all been sacked in a massive purge. Slavyangrad speculates that Zelensky is sacking everybody who's telling him things he doesn't want to hear. And given how detached from reality he has become, I find that unsurprising. But is Zelensky's, are Zelensky's delusions quite so different from what we see in the West? All these articles that appear across the media now, that all that's needed is to increase the forces, the production of uh, weapons in the West, that what we need to do is to transfer, transition to a war economy that by itself will suffice to turn the whole situation round. And well, if that happens, then we will 
to be able to defeat the Russians after all. I discussed these fantasies in my video yesterday. And these fantasies are being peddled after yet another fantasy, which I've discussed previously, also appears to be on the brink of biting the dust. We have this now thanks to the Estonian Defence Minister, Hanno Pevkura. Um, the minister tells us that, um, I'm taking this from Slavyangrad, I get to read out the whole passage. There's still not enough funds for the transfer of Czech shells to Ukraine. According to Hevkura, there are places in the world where one can buy shells, but the question is whether there is money for it. If, they, if we're talking about shells, a million shells, and this is about 3 billion euros, at the moment we can say that there is more money missing than shells. It is now difficult to predict when shells may hit the front. Some may arrive in a few months, some only before the end of the year. So this is what is coming of President Pavel's brilliant scheme to buy shells on the international arms market. It's exactly what I said would happen. The arms dealers, the people who hold these shells, they see the Europeans coming with large amounts of money, desperate for shells, so they're raising the price. And then I would add that um, Pe Pevkura also tells us that um, when the shells do arrive, it's essential anyway to check their condition because some of them may be duds. In fact, quite a lot of them, I can assure you, will be. <laughs> so there we go. It, it is exactly what I predicted with this plan of Pavel's. The last thing you want to do when you find yourself in a situation like the one you're in now is announce to the world that you want to buy shells and you're prepared to pay any price for them. Because any price is what you will be asked to pay. So you come with one and a half billion or five billion euros for shells and the price goes up to 10 and you will get shells. But some of those shells will be duds and you won't get the shells you want and the arms dealers will go away rich and that's all you're going to achieve. It's a stupid plan to start with. And we see that, as I said, it's already starting to unravel. And it's not me saying it. It's the defence minister of Estonia, who presumably is in a position to know. And if you go back a couple of weeks to the programmes which I made when I discussed President Pavel's plan, I said this would happen. I wasn't engaging in any startling insights. I wasn't saying anything particularly original, but there it is. We see that things have turned out exactly, exactly as I predicted. And anybody who knows anything at all about the way markets work would have predicted that it would. We've had the same shambles with the oil price cap and this latest cunning plan to buy shells to provide Ukraine with shells in that way. Well, that has also failed as well. Now, some months ago, Putin made an observation about Ukraine. He said that any country that has to depend entirely on another country for its military equipment is ultimately going to lose any war. And this is true. Um, Zelensky dreams of game-changing Western weapons. He fantasizes about vast drone fleets that will defeat the Russians. He wants um, equipment that the West simply doesn't have or can't afford to give him. He continues to wildly overestimate Western industrial capacities. And he fools his own people. He deceives his own people even as the lights across Ukraine flicker and in time go out with stories about 
more counteroffensives, disregarding the advice, the, the lesson he ought to have learned from the counteroffensive he launched last year, which failed. The one thing he won't do, the one thing he cannot apparently do, is talk peace. Now, I spoke about Field Marshal Keitel and the moustachioed gentleman from Vienna that he had to work for. I don't want to push this too far, but there are aspects of this performance from Zelensky, which I have to say remind me of some of the accounts of how that moustachioed gentleman from Vienna was behaving in the weeks and months before the, the fall of Berlin. Now, there are some people, it must be said, in the West who do have sense and an understanding of reality. Dominic Cummings, who was um, once Boris Johnson's senior advisor, somebody who worked in Russia in the 1990s and who knows the country and knows the people there. Anyway, he's been writing recently about the war, amongst other things, on his blog. He wrote this piece. He said, the war didn't start in February 2022. It started in 2014. President Putin declared in the autumn of 2021 and actually sent a draft treaty that they wanted NATO to sign to promise no more NATO enlargement. That was what he sent us and was a precondition for not invading Ukraine. Of course, we didn't sign that, so he went to war to prevent NATO, more NATO, close to his borders. And we've had confirmation of this, as he points out, recently from Stoltenberg. Now, I should say that you'll find that it's an earlier, um, it's an earlier thing from Cummings. Um, it's been pointed out to me that he said that before. Well, there you have it. Someone close to power or recently close to power in Britain retains that sense of reality. I remember when Cummings was in Downing Street that many people were claiming, quite falsely as it happens, that he was the person who was actually running the British government. If only, is all I can say. I don't want to dwell too much on that. I mean, as we could see, that isn't true. Instead, as we know, um, Johnson um, ousted him, gained a whole set of new advisors, went on entirely a different route, and here we are. Instead, of sense founded on reality, on practical, realistic facts, we have illusions and invocations of the will. Now, anybody who knows anything about the political movements that dominated Central and Southern Europe in the 1930s and 1940s, will know, any will knows, is that they placed a massively exaggerated emphasis on will. In fact, one of the most famous film produced in Germany in the 1930s actually has the title Triumph of the Will. Well, we know how that turned out. And it's not difficult to guess how it will turn out in Ukraine. This is where I finish my program today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. Please remember to check. Um, um, if you Sorry, if, please remember if you want to support our work, you can go to Patreon and subscribe star links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop where you will find all sorts of amazing things, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel.
Thank you again. More from me soon. Have a very good day.